Is Patty coming, Shanna? She, she is. She just needed me. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Rochester Planning Commission on November 2nd, 2020, the night before our, uh, our big election day. Uh, I'd like to ask the clerk at this point to call the roll. Yes, Chairman McGee. Here. Vice Chairman Lord. Here. Mayor Bixon. Here. Mayor Pro Tem and Secretary Bavacqua. Here. Commissioner Clark Martin is expected. Commissioner Gossin. Here. Commissioner Hauser. Here. Commissioner King. Here. Commissioner Stone. Here. Quorum. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. At this point, uh, we're going to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask Commissioner Sarah King to do that for us tonight. The rest of us will watch, and that way we won't run over each other. That works pretty well. We're going to pretend I'm standing. There we I, pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. Thank you, Sarah, for doing Thank that. You. The next uh, item, number four, is approval of the minutes of the regular meeting. I think it might have been the special meeting of October 22nd, 2020. Uh, commissioners, have you had the chance to review the minutes? Are there any additions, deletions, corrections? So moved. Who, who made that motion? So Mayor, moved. moving things along. We have a support. 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 We'll call that Matt Stone supporting that. Any other discussion on the minutes? Mm -hmm. The roll call, please. Dixon. Yes. Stone. Yes. Lavacqua. Yes. Clark Martin. Yes. Gasson? Yes. Hauser? Yes. King? Yes. Lord? Yes. McGee? Yes. Thank you. Next item, number five, consideration of a site plan and special project for the proposed multifamily project to be located at 210 Diversion. Vidi is going to uh, take this up in a second, but this is the second time we have uh, at a visit from these folks, and uh, they've obviously put a lot of uh, time and energy into the preparation of this project. Just so the commissioners and the public are aware, there be no decision on this tonight. It's strictly continuation of the discussion. The only decision we could make, and I don't see that happening tonight, is uh, to schedule this for a public hearing. And at least at this point, it doesn't look like we're quite ready for that step yet. So with that video, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the city's request, this is a preliminary review, as you just clarified. I have reviewed a proposal from Mr. Berend on behalf of 210 Diversion LLC to construct a five-story, 41-unit, multiple-family residential building. The site is located on the south side of Diversion. Let me share the plan with you. Okay, It's located on the south side of Diversion. <clears throat> and um, as it goes east from First Street, and it's split zoned into two different zoning districts, larger portion of it O2 and a smaller portion of it I2, which is Industrial 2 District. Residential uses are not permitted in the I2 District. Upper story apartments are permitted as a special exception in the O2 District. Due to the split zone nature of the parcel, the applicant is seeking special projects approval from the Planning Commission. Uh, as Planning Commission is well aware, special projects is a tool available in the City of Rochester zoning ordinance, which allows for applicants to seek deviations from the strict provisions of the ordinance in order to come up with a development proposal that is innovative and that provides a tangible public benefit to the community that a straight site plan cannot. The site is identified in the 2014 master plan land use map as a PICA, a potential intensity change area which is also called a special projects area, and it does qualify for such consideration by the Planning Commission. Now, I will um, go to the site plan sheet so that the Planning Commission can follow along. I am 
going to the first floor plan because it's easier to see it in color and follow along with when I'm describing it. Now, the site actually comprises of three parcels of land, two parcels of land that are located in the city of uh, Rochester, and then a parcel of land over here that is located in the city of Rochester Hills. Um, the applicant has stated that the building footprint is going to completely occupy the parcels that are within the city of Rochester, and the Rochester Hills parcel will undergo some grading and clearing to accommodate floodplain volume compensation. I do have a copy of an email from the planning manager of Rochester Hills, which clarifies that this project will require approval of multiple permits from their planning commission and city council, namely for tree removal, the floodplain permit, and the site plan engineering aspect, since they are going to be doing grading. We want the applicant to put together a proposed timeline. A special project has got a specific timeline in the city's process about how it goes before planning commission and then to city council. Um, the applicant has to put together where the city of Rochester Hills would fit into this entire timeline process because at some point of time, both those approvals will have to overlap so that the project is moving along consistently and one step is not ahead of a step that already had to be completed. The floor plan, if you look at it, includes a common workspace over here. And the applicant has clarified that amenities will be restricted for use by the residents only. I would just like some clarification that the office workspace is also considered an amenity because amenities are typically recreational uh, things, components that are included as part of the site. So a little clarification is needed. Now, based upon the 41 units, and the number of one, two, and three bedroom units, the site requires a total of 70 parking spaces. The plan proposes 68 interior parking spaces, which is uh, the first floor level and the basement level. And then they have three additional parking spaces within the public right of way. Parking spaces that are within a public right of way cannot be considered towards a site's parking requirement. These parking spaces would need approval from both the DPW and the city council. The city engineers, A and W, in a letter dated August 28th, have indicated that they are not comfortable with the way these spaces are designed because it is located on the curve of diversion, which already has site distance. So the city's engineer at this time is not in support of this proposed design. Now, the ground floor parking that you see over here is controlled by a garage door. The garage door is recessed about 22 feet, see my cursor, 22 feet from uh, the road and most of the driveway length, the property line is over here where my cursor is moving. So most of this driveway length is actually part of the public right of way. We have concerns that when you press the automatic button for a garage door to go up, it does take a few seconds. Uh, what is the, the concern here is vehicles actually backing up on the street waiting to get into the site when the garage door is opening or closing. So that continues to remain a point of concern for us. When the applicant appeared before you, we had told them that a full traffic study is required because the planning commission diversion, first street, and further west has always been an issue of concern. Um, the applicant did get a detailed traffic study done by Fleece and Vanderbrink. A copy of that is attached to your package tonight. At the time I did the letter, I did not have a copy of the study, but the applicant did provide it to me afterwards. So I took a look at it and the study contends that the 41 unit development and these additional cars will not really create any issue on diversion per street or further vets. The applicant has also stated that if the parcel uh, were built for offices, it would possibly generate more traffic than the proposed residential use. Well, a clarification there would be only part of the parcel is zoned office. The rest of it is zoned industrial. So it would not necessarily generate more traffic than a residential development unless a comparison is provided for us to review. So we continue to have concerns about the traffic. The traffic study is very elaborate. It's got details. It's got road trips. Um, but as in the case of previous projects, um, that have been reviewed up per street, the concern remains that the numbers and the data that is collected for some reason doesn't seem to match with the reality of people who drive on these streets on a daily basis. Um, the parking calculations do not include any spaces for the
this work workroom space area. Assuming these are amenities that are restricted to the residents only, that would be fine. But there is another comment in the applicant's letter that says that the trash room will be monitored on a daily basis by on-site personnel, and the landscaping will also be maintained by on-site personnel. Now, how many employees is this building going to have, and where are they going to park? Because we are already under parked at this point. Now, if you see the ground floor room, this is where the trash room is. There are chutes from all the units that were dumped the trash over here. And then the trash, this dash dotted line you see, is the route to get the trash out to the curbside for a company to come pick it up and leave. Now, my concern is, first of all, you have a garage door, you have vehicles trying to enter and exit. The trash truck comes here. The trash truck individual is going to get down or the employees are going to roll this all the way to the curb, that is going to be a few minutes at least, even if they work fast. And now you will have a big trash truck that is parked on the curb of diversion, which creates another big concern for safety reasons. The ordinance also has um, a tree ordinance, which the applicant is required to comply with. The site I'm reviewing only the portion that is located in the city of Rochester has got a total of 17 trees all of which are going to be taken out because the building is property line to property line. The applicant has calculations to show how the caliber count of the trees that are being removed and they are proposing replacement. The replacement trees are located on the upper levels of the building. I will uh, the elevation sheet so you'll have an idea of what uh, talking about. So if you look at the upper levels, the applicant will have more trees on the upper tiers, and these would come towards the replacement, and the applicant also proposes to pay into the tree fund. Um, we are not sure if any of these are landmark trees that needs to be checked, and if there are landmark trees, the city council would need to approve their removal. We had asked the applicant to submit a sustainability evaluation, self story they have done that. Uh, they have provided a detailed analysis of it. There is some discrepancy in the tree count because that is under the watershed health indicator in our sustainability evaluation. The numbers that are noted on the landscape plan do not match what is on the sustainability evaluation. So that needs to be reconciled. The bigger issue I had was the applicant states that the sewer is located in Rochester Hills. But if you look at the city engineer's letter dated August 28, it states that a new sewer connection must be made. Uh, the plan also proposes no new utility leads, but the DPW department has commented that the site has an undersized cast iron pipe that needs to be tapped and removed. So if there are any old utilities uh, with 41 new units being added in, it's obvious that the utilities will have to be upgraded in order to be able to take a load of the proposed development. Finally, in order to be considered as a special project, the applicant has to quantify what public benefit is being achieved by this project. Now, the applicant's proposal is to contribute $35,000 to be used for funding the Watertown Park or for funding a pedestrian bridge connection over the Clinton River Trail. I would like the Planning Commission's input on this matter. Now, the intent of the special project has always been to encourage developments that seek a deviation so that they bring some unique design or unique quality, or they add a component to the project that benefits the community as a whole. While on previous projects, to some extent, monetary contributions have been accepted and have been offered by other developments, the city would like to see a tangible benefit in the form of an improvement that benefits the city and the users rather than have just monetary contributions being made as a public benefit. I think Public benefit should be something tangible that the applicant includes for the community. Um, the applicant had appeared before you on June 1st for a concept plan presentation. And subsequently, I have spoken with the applicant and the applicant has interacted with city staff. The plan set that they have submitted to you at this time is a complete set. It's got all the plans, all the details that are needed. Um, typically, when I have so many comments in my preliminary review, the project is not presented before you till the issues are resolved. But this is a special project. The applicant is seeking a lot of deviation. I would not be making a recommendation on any of them unless I feel the Planning Commission is open and receptive to project of this magnitude. Directing the applicant to keep making changes and coming back to me would place them in a position where they would 
probably think that if all these recommendations are met, we should get approval. This project has got a lot of implications based upon its size, its design, traffic issues, uh, the mass of the building, the fact that it occupies the entire property, the fact that it is in two jurisdictions. So it is critical that this be discussed tonight at the Planning Commission and you provide the applicant and myself some direction on what changes, if any, you would like seen on this project, what is acceptable and what is simply not something that you would want to consider under the purview of special projects. So please be critical of the project and give all your feedback, because I think it's important for the applicant to hear what would be acceptable to the city of Rochester at this point of time. I would be happy to answer any questions you might have and also help along as the applicant is speaking. When the applicant is presenting, either they can pull up their own presentation or I'll be happy to scroll through the plans and match up the work. Media, for now, would you put the uh, site plan back up? Absolutely. I will go back. So do I understand that this is lot line to lot line? No yes, this, this is the entire property line over here. The whole thing, building completely occupies every bit of the property. And this is the parcel in Rochester Hills that is going to be graded to provide for any stormwater detention stuff. So the building is pretty much full coverage. Okay, uh, questions for video at this point? I I have one, uh, if if I can. Please. Um, when we talk about deviations, you know, that are being requested here, can you help maybe clarify those, what those deviations would be? Um, maybe that's a complicated question because I know we have split zoning here, but um, I think it's important for us to understand really what, what's being requested over and above you know, if, for example, if it was just to be rezoned to a, a multiple family district or something, uh, I think it would be important for us to understand what are the deviations, the over and above asks that are occurring here. On this project, uh, Commissioner Lord, to start with, the use itself is a deviation because the use by itself is not permitted in this district. So from there, we would be moving on to if they are seeking a deviation from the amount of parking. If the parking requirement is 70 and now they have employees, and one of the things they have mentioned is there is a public lot available 400 to the north um, in shared parking parlance and planning. The maximum distance considered for shared parking would be 300 feet. 400 feet is not considered as a walkable distance for parking and walking to a facility. So um, the applicant. If they cannot provide the required parking, which I cannot see being accomplished unless a number of units are dropped, in that case, they will be seeking a deviation from the parking requirement. Um, in terms of uh, any trees that they might, might not be able to replace or pay into the fund, that would be a deviation. Um, since the underlying use itself is not permitted, we won't be looking at uh, setbacks or any such requirements under the special projects umbrella. But if it was a, I don't, and I, I guess, tell me if this is not appropriate to look at it this way, but this was, if this was a multi, multi-family district mm -hmm. and, and they were proposing a straight zoning use here, would, oh. there, would there be further deviations that are being asked for, including setbacks? Absolutely. If it's, say, if there's a rezoned to RM1, RM2, one of those districts, uh, I'm thinking, the higher rise so to probably be RM2. Um, they would need variances from setbacks, um, which is what brought us to Riverfront Place. Riverfront Place, the reason it was a use that was permitted in the district, the reason they had to come before US Special Projects was because they were not complying with their setbacks, which is 40 feet from each property line. So, what yeah. Setbacks video, real quickly, what, what are the setbacks that apply here? Uh, the setbacks for an RM district are RM1 or RM2. I will verify it for you. But if I remember on the Riverfront project, it was 40 feet front yard and 40 feet each of the side yards. In this parcel, if you took out 40 feet on each of the side yards, the parcel would not be available. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yes, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so, you know, when I, when I was looking at this, 
Um, I, I guess I had some problems just with the with the process. Um, you know, we had a conceptual meeting before. I mean, now this is another conceptual meeting. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that we should be designing this project for, for the applicant. Um, you know, we kind of gave them some things and, you know, if they want us, whatever they want to submit, we should have a public hearing um, and discuss it. But to kind of, in, in this body, well, this looks okay. Well, I don't know. There may be this. Well, we'll die. I, I don't know if that's a good way uh, to, to, to do that. And so I guess I'm a, I'm a little uncomfortable with process. And I guess I'd like to hear other commissioners as well. I mean, I, I saw this list of things and I was like, you know, my first thought was, why is this even coming to us? Well, Vidya, I think, explained her, her position on that, um, but. If I may clarify, Mayor. Yes. Uh, this is no longer a concept during. The applicant has submitted a formal application for consideration as a special project. This is actually step one in a special project consideration, preliminary hearing. If they were to pass the preliminary hearing, then you would set it for public hearing. Um, they are in a formal process at this point of time. It's no longer a concept plan review. If what you see before you is not acceptable, you would just not schedule the public hearing and the applicant would have to go back to the point. They are in the formal process. So do we have a vote on that today? Is how, how does that work? Um, or is that just, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just curious. That's why I was unsure about the process. Here. Yes, this it, you would be voting on it because it's a formal application that's been submitted. This is step one of the special projects approval process, which is a preliminary plan hearing and setting for public hearing. So if you're not ready for public hearing, you would either, you would take some kind of motion, either give the applicant direction and say, this either, okay, you're setting it for public hearing and you want public feedback. And the public hearing phase can last for a while till they keep changing it based upon public comment or if the plan is not in any way, shape or form that the planning commission wants to set to a public hearing at this time, would uh, deny the preliminary plan itself. Vidya, I think the only thing we could vote on tonight is whether or not we want to schedule a public hearing. Right. That, okay, so that's what... That's Nothing what. else. Nothing else. Other commissioners? Yes, Mr. Chairman, if you're still looking for questions to the planner, I do have a question. Yes, please. Re regarding the lot line to lot line. In previous um, recent developments that were near the property line would require the maintenance access or easement even. And um, that would be one question. Why wouldn't we do that here? The other question is constructability. How, how do you, do you even ask that question of the applicant? How do you plan to build this if you don't own the property to the sides in which to maneuver to do that? I'm just generally curious about what the, the planning view of that is. I, I think the constructor probably has his own view, but I wonder what our planning view of that is. I believe the applicant has shown a sheet, I'm going to try and scroll to it, that they are getting a grading or a construction access easement in order to be able to, um, if you look at this particular oh, sheet, yeah. it says proposed temporary grading and construction easement. Um, this is, however, like you said, Commissioner Gasson, this is only for the construction portion for the long-term maintenance would also be required. That's that's a very good point. Who owns the property to the east? I know it's the slope of the road. It did not say it was in the right of way. Property to the east is uh, I'm I'm not sure who owns the property. Maybe Nick might have some information, but I'm, here, here is the full parcel. I will zoom out a little bit so you have an you can see how the. Okay, let me go down. Okay. This yeah, is the Rochester. Can, I'll look it up right now. Okay. This is the Rochester Hills portion. Of the is, that, is that portion at all buildable from what we see right now? The yes. Rochester Hills portion? I'm sorry, I was minimizing up over here. A lot um, of a lot of floodplain in there. Yeah. There is a lot of grading going on here. 
the mobile for them to be uh, mm -hmm. able to do it. The applicant should be able to give us a better idea of these. This says wetlands. All the gray shaded area you see here are all wetlands. Any other questions for Vidya before we have the applicant uh, speak? Yeah, I, I'd like to uh, actually kind of follow up on, on the mayor's comments. And it's it's really just, again, about, about the process. Uh, the comments don't really reflect on the applicant, but um, you know, I, I've kind of lost faith in the special project uh, designation and process. Um, called for a moratorium on it. Um, I won't be commenting on the project at all. I don't want any of my comments to be uh, brought up in the future for litigious purposes. So um, uh, I'll be bailing out of this one. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Who do we have uh, here tonight to speak for the applicant? The variant is here, who represents Student and Diversion LLC. Who is here? I don't see. I don't see him on the video here. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> uh, would you please give us your name and uh, address, and then? Uh, I have a question. Uh, who who has a question? I do. Uh, this is uh, Patricia Clark Martin, Mr. Oh, Martin. Okay, go ahead. Can you take the screen oh. down, video. So yeah. Um, on the sheet. Uh, I just have questions because I need a little bit more clarification on your, uh, you know, number eleven with the because on the sheet here, uh, what is it? What sheet is it? Uh, I don't know. It's not. It's a site plan, but it says um, the the storm sewer connection option A and option B. Was that addressed in your notes, um, Vidya? Yes, I believe storm sewer is being addressed. My question was about sanitary sewer, sanitary, uh, sanitary sewer and water. That's where I was trying to figure out. How much of the utilities they are connecting to Rochester Hills versus how much is being connected into Rochester system? And I believe uh, the city of Rochester's the utilities in that area are a little aged pipes over there. So if there is possibility of upgrade, that would be required as part of the project. Okay. But we don't know which option is going to be used yet. Uh, Nick, are you able to tell us where this the uh, sewer connection should be made, Nick? Say that again. Where should the sewer and water connections be made here? Oh, I don't know yet. They have to meet with AEW. Is there a uh, a main in diversion? I honestly don't know. We have. I don't know that they've met. I know they've met with AEW. They would know better than me. Okay, they're not on here tonight. I don't believe. No. Okay, Patty, did you have other questions? Not not at this time. Okay, good enough, good enough. So uh, could we have the, uh, whoever's gonna speak for the petitioner, uh, again, introduce yourself and then uh, please uh, take it from there and, and tell us what you've got here. Sure, uh, Roger Barrent, 6435 Apple Orchard Lane, Rochester Hills, 48306. Welcome back, Roger, good to see you. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm happy to be back. And of course, um, we're very happy and excited to present this project tonight. Um, we put a lot of work and effort into it. Um, we think it's a beautiful project, an appropriate project on a difficult site um, that we believe is appropriate in size, scale, shape, use for this part of town. Um, I grew up in Shelby Township, uh, and then I moved to Rochester, and now I live in Rochester Hills. Um, I've been in this area my entire life, except for college. Um, one of the things that's always drawn me to Rochester and the area in general was this South Street diversion area. I think it's underappreciated, underdeveloped, and has a ton of potential. Um, that's one of the things that drew me to 210 diversion. Um, I think it's location to the overpass, um, with the overpass diversion, the spatial quality, the river. Um, I think it's a desirable 
piece. I think it's a piece that has sat for 40 years because it's it's not the easiest site to develop. Um, and we don't take on easy sites. If it was a straight uh, zoning and you put up the building, you know, that would be one thing, but this just doesn't lend itself to that. And it probably never lends itself to that. So I think what we're proposing is the highest and best use in appropriate design and an appropriate building for this site. Um, of course, there's issues um, that, you know, we're here in front of the Planning Commission to work with you on. Uh, we don't have all the answers up front immediately. So, um, you know, if it's parking in the right of way, the length of the driveway, how the trash gets taken out, I don't know if that affects the overall project. We're talking about 41 nice loft units in downtown Rochester for potentially the next 100 years or more. Um, so uh, we are quite proud of what we've come up with. We've tried to not be cynical about the architecture design. I think you see that a lot in developments lately where people try to do the bare minimum, get away with something and put up the building as quick as they can and get a return on it and move on. That's not what we're here for. Um, as I mentioned, I live just off of Orion just north of downtown Rochester. Um, this is a project that we put our heart into that I wanna be proud of the rest of my life and my reputation's on the line for this type of project. And I do think that it will be a enormous net benefit to the city of Rochester. And that's the way we've gone about the project. Um, so I'm happy to address a lot of Vidya's concerns and questions. I, I think a lot of them do already have answers. So why don't you go through that, uh, Roger? Sure, I'd be happy to. But let me first uh, share my screen real quick, because um, I think it's important to actually see the project. Um, this is what we're proposing, and let it load up here. Um, so again, forty-one units. Um, loft style, a mix of two, one bedroom, two bedrooms, and a couple of studio apartments, parking under, um, and so that kind of leads me to uh, the first issue. So the proposed timeline, um, of course, a project like this that's split between two jurisdictions, um, it's, it's difficult to get your hands around until we have a first meeting, right? So this is the first meeting. Now I can go back to Rochester Hills and say, hey, here's what the path looks like from Rochester. What's your path look like? And then I can kind of get the two on the same line and figure out what the approval meetings will start to look like. Um, but, but without kind of getting on this agenda, knowing where, where we stand with the project from your feedback, uh, hopefully tonight, um, it, it's hard to anticipate what we would be needing to do with Rochester Hills. Uh, we talked to Rochester Hills, mm -hmm. and although we're not doing any new construction, we're just regrading and removing a few trees. In their wisdom, they've seen that we need to do full site plan approval and full city commission approval. So, you know, it, it, it's going to be a trick to manage both processes um, through the development. Um, so, of course, we're more than happy to put that timeline together and provide it as soon as we get a bit more clarity from everyone. Um, because obviously, the primary project is Rochester. So, that's going to drive the car more than anything at this point and how, how we move this forward. Um, so, the second piece was the, uh, the lobby area and the library. So, our intention for 210 diversion um, <clears throat> is that it literally is going to be a lobby with a private library for tenant use only. Um, it's not even necessarily an office. It's just a place for people to go to get away to do some work or whatever they feel like doing in the library. So you wouldn't be locating your architectural firm here? Uh, <laughs> no, that's I would not. Although I'd like to, that's not what this is intended for, no. Okay, thank you. Um, so just quickly to go through a couple of the other spaces, these are just inspirational ideas, but 
it gives you an idea of the direction of the interior look and feel of the building. Um, so we got the lobby, library. Um, we are proposing a dog grooming area where someone could come in. Uh, <clears throat> there'd be available hours for people to bring their pets to get dog grooming within the building so they didn't have to leave uh, to that thing. Um, also a yoga spin fitness area. And then this is just an idea in terms of the verticality of the atrium. Um, what we're thinking in terms of some vertical vines or plant systems uh, within the building. Um, <clears throat> so the library is, is literally just that. There, there's no other intended use in terms of an office. Um, One of the questions was, are you going to have employees on site? We do anticipate having one to two employees. Um, I think in terms of the maintenance person, that's probably someone that's part-time, um, or we might have a management company doing it. But we do uh, plan to have a manager on site, you know, during business hours. So not likely a tenant from the building? I don't think so. I don't think we've thought that far ahead in terms of how that would work, but Probably not. It would probably be a full-time person that was there during the day. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let me get to the right plan here. So in terms of the parking on in the right of way, those three parking spots. Um, we did end up talking to our engineer after we got the review comments uh, from Vidya, and we do agree um, that those three spots are probably not appropriate based on uh, vision on the curb. So uh, we've already looked into taking those three spots out. I've been able to, in reconfiguring some of the initial plan ideas, um, <clears throat> gain back at least one or two spots in the parking garage by modifying some of the vestibule area. Uh, currently, we're one parking spot over. So we're required to have 70. We have 71. You take away the three, we're down to 68. <clears throat> but I think we can add two more back to get back up to 70. So we would meet the parking requirement and we would not be asking for any variance on parking. And they would all be internal? They would be internal, yes. Um, as as far as the the drive and the um, into the garage, um, we initially had 15 feet, and uh, based on Vidya's initial review, we increased that to 22 feet. There is still some room in the garage as it's designed to pull that in a few more feet, if need be. Um, I did spend some time this weekend driving around downtown Rochester. And the city's own garages don't have even 22 feet to pull into the new parking garages. Um, and I know uh, <clears throat> Walnut and the other street are busier than diversion. Uh, so although I appreciate that it could be an issue, I don't really see it being an issue that if one car can pull in, wait for the garage door to go up, that there would be any backup onto the street. Um, I drive by this area quite a bit. And I go by First Street Lots all the time, and I have yet to even see the garage door open or anyone go in and out of it. And I go by at random times. So um, I think our 22-foot drive is appropriate. It gets the car out of the way while the garage door goes up. Um, but to make it any longer, I don't think is necessary. Although, as I mentioned, we could extend it a couple feet. Um, the other thing that we're looking at, um, and I guess this is twofold, we do have a very good relationship with Joe Salome, who's the owner of the building directly across the street from us. We've already talked to him um, initially about doing uh, shared parking, doing a shared parking agreement uh, for off hours. So between seven, at night and seven in the morning, that if we did have overflow visitor parking, that we would be able to use three to five spots in his parking lot. Now, our project at this point doesn't ride on that being available, but it is an option that we've looked into um, 
to facilitate off hour parking, which is probably our higher demand parking, which is overnight. Um, I think the issue came up also about who owns the parcels around us. Uh, it happens to be Joe Lechurko. We've met with him a couple of times at this point, and he's fully on board with our project, and he's very amenable to any easements or other types of uh, access that we need for our site for constructability and for any future land use. So could you go around the perimeter and tell us who owns the adjoining parcels? Yes. So my understanding is Joe Lechurko owns the entire west piece and then he owns the south piece that's in Rochester Hills up to our our piece that's off the south in Rochester Hills. So he owns everything west of us and then this corner piece that's south of us. I don't know if anyone owns any of this. This might be the Oakland That's M dot right away. Yeah, I just confirmed that's M dot right away. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, so there's no one or anything that owns that in terms of a private landowner. Yeah. Um, so we've actually talked to Joe about working in concert with his future development plans. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but his current plan right now is that this would be a driveway into his development. Um, so that would allow us access to the front and back of our building, and he would also allow us a construction easement. Um, again, that all needs to be hammered out, but we have a really good relationship with him, and I feel like that's something that we can provide when needed. Is that something that could be in included in a site plan submission you would make? It could be, yeah, and I, I, we would definitely have to talk to him again about kind of taking it to the next level in terms of a serious agreement, but yes. Which might then allow your parking garage entrance to be on the west side? We did talk about that, actually, with Joe. Um, again, I don't like, as a developer, to have my projects contingent on the landowner next to me doing anything. I'd like to have it still stand alone and be independent if anything ever did adversely occur west of us. Um, so I would like to keep the drive and entrance off of Diversion Street as part of this development. Roger, Roger can I, or Mr. Chairman, can I interrupt for one minute? Yeah, Roger, I, you I, my point. I, yeah, I think for full disclosure, I don't think Joe owns that yet. He has it under option with George Crook. So I don't think he flat out owns it. I don't think he purchases it. Unless it just happened in the last couple of days. But just make sure that we, we follow up with that because he's seeking to get his property, Crux in Rochester Hills. I, I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. So you might just check with him. This is the entire, we'll call it truck repair parcel. Right. So he's got Van Horn, the cement plant, and Crux under option. I know he owns the cement plant, but. I'm not sure if Crux is part of the, what wraps around the back of Rogers. So um, again, not a big deal at this point, but we'll just have to make sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I can clarify that with him. I know when we met with him about a month ago, he did mention something about closing on one of these pieces. Uh, again, I'm not sure, but I can talk to him to clarify some of that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, in terms of the traffic study itself, we did have a full-blown traffic study done. Um, it does anticipate Riverfront being developed and a few other developments in the area. Uh, their, their wording to us was that you're under 50 trips a day or 500 something. I'm not even sure what the wording was. Uh, but in their terminology, this site didn't even qualify for a full traffic study uh, based on their understanding of the ordinance and Rochester requirements. Uh, we're talking about 41 units. I think it's seven trips in the morning and nine at night coming in. Um, the impact is very minimal. And in terms of, well, would an office impact be higher? It would up to a threshold. So at about a 15,000 square foot office, the numbers are about equal between this development and a, and a you know, a three a three story, five thousand square foot floor plate would be about an equal in terms of traffic impact. You get over fifteen to twenty thousand, um, then the impact would be higher for more on this site. So 
if we did the equivalent building that's directly across from us, the Salome building, um, that impact on traffic would be higher than what we're proposing at this point, because that building, from my understanding, is 24,000 square feet. Um, so a 24,000 square foot office building. Now, again, I don't know if that would fit this footprint, but that'll give you a kind of a relative scale of, of the impact of office versus um, what we're proposing here. I believe also in the RM zoning, we're allowed to go eight stories. Um, we're only going five here, so we're actually under what an RM uh, zoned site would allow for. I believe also light industrial allows for seven stories on this site. Again, we're at five. So if we took that light industrial sliver and went a full seven stories, that's what we would be allowed under the current zoning to do. Um, again, in, propose, in understanding the difficulties of this site, Vidya mentioned it. You take into account all the setbacks on the site, and I believe you can actually see it. Just give me a second here. Um, Here we go. So um, you can see the setbacks, front zoning setback, the rear setback, and then the front zoning setback here and the rear zoning setback, and then the side yard setbacks. This site basically becomes um, unbuildable. And, and I don't mean it to be unbuildable completely, but in a modern sense, uh, for the value of the property, uh, there's nothing economically that makes sense to go on this site um, as it sits if you went straight zoning. It just doesn't make sense. So again, <laughs> we've come in what we believe is an appropriate size building and an appropriate design and scale building for this site. Um, Are you able to make any use of your parcel to the south? What was that? Sorry. Are you able to make any use of your parcel to the south in this development? Um, not really. And, and part of uh, the reason, it's currently zoned R1. So it's a landlocked single family. Sorry about that. Um, your first uh, reservation call. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, it's a, it's a landlocked single family zoned R1 uh, site. And as I mentioned, even for just regrading this, Rochester Hills is asking for full site plan approval and a city commission approval. So what we've tried to do and in our design is the shaded area here is the current floodplain. So as Vidya mentioned, we're basically regrading our site and this piece to the south, the Rochester Hills site, to contain this volume of floodplain that currently curls into our site. Um, so we think again, uh, using this south piece to do the floodplain mitigation is again, probably the highest and best use of this piece, um, especially considering there's no access. We did look at potentially parking this piece, um, but again, talking to our engineers with the way this needs to be regraded, parking would be very difficult because uh, we would need to park up here. And as you can see from the grading, we're we have a man-made steep slope from Rochester Road on the back half of our site, which uh, would be very difficult to get any kind of parking on that piece. Um, as far as the sewer leads and other utility leads, um, we are proposing two different areas to connect to the storm sewer. We would of course work with AEW to determine the best way to do that. Uh, from our understanding, the volume and everything, we're okay. It's just a matter of where we connect. Um, in talking to Jason Boughton at Rochester Hills, he informed me that the sanitary sewer is at the street, but it is owned and operated by Rochester Hills. Uh, again, he told us not a big deal. It's a matter of paperwork um, that the engineering would have to sign off on, uh, but not a reason to, uh, not, not a big reason for concern. So 
everything we'll be doing this is, is going sanitary. out to the school. This Sorry. is the sanitary about? Yeah, sanitary, according to him, is a Rochester Hills owned and operated utility in front of this building. But in Diversion Street. Yes, that's correct. It has nothing to do with the Rochester Hills piece itself. How about water? Uh, water, I think, again, is at the street here, and we're proposing to connect to the water um, at the street. So everything's going towards the street. Um, so this leads to the next one, which was the the tangible improvement or the city give back. And um, we're, we're proposing right now to uh, pay into the fund that's uh, developing our, the, the Watertown Park Initiative. Uh, you know, of course, we're open to ideas, but it's, it's difficult for us to propose a give back um, when we're not sure what even those parameters might be other than what would you propose. Um, I believe the city, Nick, Vidya, the planning commission knows better where those funds could be spent for optimal effectiveness than us proposing something. If you want us to, we're more than happy to do that. We did talk about a connection, I don't have it here, um, doing a pedestrian bridge over the Clinton River just past the office building um, that's to the north of us. Right now, you have to cross in front of the office building, cross the street to go over the bridge, and then cross back over the street to get to the park or other side where the parking lot is. Um, we had an initial thought that we could potentially put a pedestrian bridge, keep it on the east side of diversion so that you didn't have to cross back over uh, across the bridge. Now, again, there's a hundred complications with that, it being a river, a bridge, and other complications where we could imagine that becomes a hundred thousand, two hundred, five hundred thousand dollar project. Uh, so again, our initial thought was we would be more comfortable proposing paying into the Watertown Park and helping that project than trying to, you know, basically make something up in terms of a, a give back. So uh, that was our thought process on that piece. Um, at the uh, at the June meeting, someone suggested consideration of a stairway up to the sidewalk on the bridge. Yes, I do remember that. And the reason we shied away from that is mainly because, as we just, as Nick just mentioned, that parcel is essentially uh, the Oakland County Road Commission or the right of way. So, again, we found it might be difficult to propose steps up on that piece of property without it being our property or even in the jurisdiction of Rochester. Roger, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Um, it's this Watertown Park, I, I don't know why, I, I don't know much about this. Who, is this what, is this what the other developer is, is initiating? What am I missing here? Yeah, I believe that's correct. And, you know, this, this came out of our conversations with Nick um, in terms okay. of what would be a good use of the funds. So he, he, I don't want to throw him under the bus here, but he kind of directed us in that direction that that would be something uh, worthwhile putting the money toward. Thank you. Yeah. I, I would, uh, as we move along, appreciate some investigation into the matter of the stairway. But when you sure. come back again, uh, speak with that landowner, if you would, and talk about feasibility. But there's a wide pathway right there on the bridge. Yes, there is. And if, if you walk the site, there's actually a, a basically steps up there that are dug into the dirt from so many people yes. walking up that way. Well, plenty of uh, space to put in a nice sloped stairway probably. Yes, and, and we have no problem. We'll, we're more than happy to look, look into that. Again, I think it's the road commission that owns it, so we'll have to do some investigating into. Nick just said it's the uh, state it's of MDOT, Michigan Department of Transportation. Yeah. Oh, it's MDOT, okay. Commissioners, uh, 
This is a good time to shoot your questions to Roger. I have a few <clears throat> comments, questions, if I could just kind of lead into the conversation here. Please do. Um, the, um, based on the planner's comments regarding the development right on diversion, the street there, the parking, um, access into the garage, I think there was some comment back from the applicant that made sense, certainly for them parking. I, in my opinion, they, they have to go. It would be unsafe. Uh, and there's a little indication on the site plan for a sidewalk that kind of skirts around them to the west. And it almost makes sense to me that um, a development of this size with residents that presumably be walking to um, downtown, a sidewalk all along the west edge, and maybe the bridge on that side would make sense just for the betterment of the residents there. Um, that would be another thing. The trash doesn't make any sense to me at all to be pulled out of the building and temporarily located on the sidewalk. That would be unsightly, in my opinion, especially with a development of this quality. You want to deal with that better than that, let alone the traffic nuisance that it would cause. <clears throat> I think that component of your development needs to be thought through a little more in detail to be fitting for the building. I think that would be important. Um, my first impression of those three spots on diversion were visitor parking. And I'm not sure how that's dealt with inside the building, but I think it's a necessary thing to understand. Uh, it's particularly from a barrier-free standpoint, you know, grandma comes to visit somebody there for the first time, where does she park? Or I'm just making that up. But visitor parking would be important. The other thing that crossed my mind was loading and unloading. How is that dealt with effectively for the you know, move in, move out, deliveries, that kind of thing, you know, UPS and Amazon, and how does that happen safely on the version? I think that needs to be explained next time we see, um, you know, this refined um, a couple other things regarding that area, the, the radius coming in and out of there, and I know it's a technical thing, but it just appears not generous enough to be safe exiting the building. If you're you know, turning right, you'd be jumping over that curb all the time, I would assume. That's just a detail at this point, but I'd like to see that looked at next time we see this. Um, and I assume that this is going to be just a, some kind of proximity thing or something in your car. You press a button, the door goes up and down. You don't need a keypad, anything. That would never be the case, right? That's a question I'd yeah. be looking for a clarification on. Yeah. Um, um, Barrier-free parking in general. Uh, I see it inside the garage, and I assume that's residence parking. Um, so I, I assume that those counts are appropriate, and a planner would probably point that out if not. Um, uh, public benefit. But the public benefit, I, I, I understand the explanation the applicant gave. Um, that's not too satisfying to me. Um, I think of a, you know, the concessions or the what, what's trying to happen here. And I, maybe concession is not the right word, but. Um, there's a you know a very grand idea here, and I think it's um, exercising every possible um, area of use for the building. And I think as much thought that's gone into the building should go into the public benefit, not just a um, you know, uh, some kind of dollar value of a, a gift. Although I guess that's a good place to start. I I'd just like to see more thought uh, put into that. And um, the planner pointed out, you know, the employees there on site, uh, and then the applicant responded, yes, there'd be one to two, a manager, and then a maintenance person. But I also heard note of uh, a yoga class and the dog grooming thing. I assume those are off-site people, vendors of some sort coming to the site that would need to park also. I'd like to get that clarified for the next go around on this. Um, 
couple other things. Uh, the building is very handsome, I think. I think it looks really nice. Uh, uh, the way the renderings look, the two-dimensional stuff doesn't tell the story, but uh, compliments to the design team. And I think it's you know an attempt to make something really nice. Um, kind of disguises the fact that it's so big as a you know a mass there. I'm not saying that's inappropriate, but that's always my first reaction when I see something like that as a comparison. Uh, to some of the other silhouetted buildings in the drawings you gave. What I didn't see uh, was any kind of mechanical equipment, whether it's in the screen or on your roof plan or any through wall ventilation type things for the units themselves. So I'm really curious, how do you do that? Um, and really, how, how is that now going to impact the next volume or imaging of this building? Because I think it needs to be dealt with. And I noticed that the floor to floor seems high, uh, which is nice from a resident standpoint, but it also then accumulates to a building height that's really big. And I'm, I'm curious on how um, uh, that, that, how you came to those kind of ratios of floor to floor and, you know, you just kind of look across and what's my maximum height on the, north side of the river there, so therefore kind of let's match it on the south side. Uh, that's just a curious thought there. Um, those are generally my, my, my questions or concerns at this point. I did mention the property line thing. I think that was explained well by maybe working with neighboring property owners. Those are my questions, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the time. Thank you, David. Hello. Hello. Hi, Jane Turner, Parkdale, Rochester. I have a question. Hi, Mrs. Turner. How are you tonight? I'm good. Actually, it's a comment. Thank you. I grew up on ready? South Street. Uh huh. I rounded that curve on diversion walking to school from kindergarten on. It's a disaster. Has anybody ever? thought of putting in a roundabout. You've got three potential construction sites along First Street, Diversion, and South Street. A roundabout might save some lives and some cars. Where exactly would you put it? Well, you could go it into Turcos a little bit and put it on the curve. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the roundabout would serve both the public street and, and private driveway entrances? Correct. Okay. And it would control the traffic. That corner, that curve, you get too many traffic on there. I, I mean, it's not highly traveled at this time, but I take that as a shortcut when there's backup. And people going southbound to east come around that curve. They cut it short, and they're coming into oncoming traffic. So a roundabout, to me, would solve the traffic congestion in that part and save a life or two. So we That's will my comment. Yeah. Hope you take it. Maybe those three projected sites there could take in maybe that $25,000 could go towards that. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you very much for calling in. We appreciate it. All right. Nick, whose uh, road is that? Is that the county road? Is that our road? Is Rochester? That's our road. Diversion. Correct. Okay. Matt, what do you think? Uh, I'm not sure about the roundabout. I haven't lived down there my whole life. Um, but my, my comment is more life safety. Uh, how does a fire truck uh, access the site and get access to the rear of the building in the current plan? Roger? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I have not yet discussed it with the fire department or gotten any feedback from them. Um, obviously the building is going to be fully sprinkled. Um, and I know that's a big driver of how they handle this. 
Um, again, with the construction easement, uh, this will be flattened and accessible over time. Um, so access to the back of the building uh, could come along that easement. Um, I'm not sure how they would handle the east side in terms of working from Rochester Road, uh, but it will be relatively close um, to the building on that side, the access to the road. So I think the sp full sprinkling of the building is a, a, the biggest driver for them. Uh, but again, I haven't had a conversation to tell you one way or the other exactly how that can be handled. Okay. And then uh, northwest corner of the site, uh, you show a sidewalk that just terminates into the road. Is there actually a sidewalk there that is connecting to, or are we just dumping people into the road, building on Commissioner Gaston's comment about walkability of the site? Yeah, that's, that's another good question, obviously. Right now, as it's proposed, the sidewalk would dead end there. Again, that's the right-of-way and Lachurco's property. So we'd be happy to continue the sidewalk across to the bridge um, as potentially the give back. Uh, but as of right now, as it's drawn, the sidewalk would end there um, just like the office building sidewalk ends at the river. But the, the, the requirement is to have a sidewalk across your site. So, and, and of course, we want this as walkable as possible for the future tenants. So we would definitely look at continuing that sidewalk um, all the way across up to the bridge. Uh, last question, um, switching ends from the sidewalk to the opposite end, the southeast end of the building, the parking space along the uh, foundation wall there or the, the structural wall, uh, is that actually counted in our count for 68 interior spots or is that a useless parking spot that'll just be storage? Um, are you talking about, can you see my cursor? I can, yes, that is spot. That the spot yeah. you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, what we did is we designated this as a spot that you can't park in. So the idea would be to be able to pull in and then back fully out into this open area and then out. So currently we're counting it as a full parking spot for the build. It might be real challenging to get a car in there. It, it could be, yes. Response to Commissioner uh, Stone's question of the fire department. I have a copy of a letter from Chief C. Slick dated September 1st. And it basically says that the site plan is acceptable to the fire department subject to the following comments. And it basically includes comments about compliance with uh, sprinkling the entire building, including fire alarm systems, alarm systems, and uh, additional IFC code compliance. But if doesn't talk about access to the buildings. You might need more in-depth in uh, review and comments from the chief. I'll take the letter. <laughs> I'll forward it to you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Who else would like to speak? Who haven't we heard from? This is Commissioner King. And I had a lot of the same comments that um, I think it was Commissioner Gasson that had just brought up as far as, you know, access from to the side of the building. I think, um, you know, the the driveway in the front is a little bit challenging, the trash pickup as well. Um, one of the questions that he raised, though, was the mechanicals, and I don't think that's been addressed. Uh, sure. So two points to that. <clears throat> Uh, one, the actual rooftop units will be located on this west roof, which actually sits lower than the roof deck and garden. So those will be fully screened uh, from Diversion and from Rochester Road. Uh, the units themselves, I, I can't tell you for sure how we're going to handle the HVAC yet, uh, but right now it would probably be a traditional um, a heating and cooling system, we would put it in a closet and then vent um, out through the roof and screen those as needed. So we, we do not propose any vents coming out the side of the building. 
or any change to the elevations as as they are right now in that with that in that regard so every unit would have its own handler on the roof well a condensing unit for yeah. the air conditioning yes and then the the furnace would be in the unit themselves yeah Mr. Chairman, this is Christian Hauser, if I can. Just, Please. Uh, sure. So I'm at a slight disadvantage because I wasn't on the commission when the applicant was here previously. So um, I'm catching up to speed on this. I will tell you preliminarily, I think um, aesthetically, I think it's very presentable. And I, I think very much that the, uh, the look of this building is, is uh, pleasing. And so I'm interested to see how the applicant comes back based on the feedback from both the planner as well as the other members of the commission. So um, I'll probably just leave it at that. But I, I, I do think just from an aesthetics, it's quite pleasing. But I'm going to certainly be interested to see and hear more about the, the details as this continues forward. Thank you, Christian. You're welcome. Have we heard from everyone? I think we have. I, uh, I, I guess I have a couple. couple Eric, right ahead. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, most of my questions have already been asked, which is which is great. Um, uh, question regarding the stormwater management on the site. I, you know, we're 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 essentially taking up occupying the whole site with with roof. Um, mm -hmm. I saw. I realized that there's a piece of property to the south that's being used for floodplain mitigation. But it looked like from looking at the plans, there's potentially a couple of storm sewer connections that are heading off to the east and not directing any of that roof runoff to the south. So how is stormwater detention being managed for the site? I need a little clarification on that. Uh, yeah, so um, the way we're handling it is, is a bit unique, but uh, what we're proposing is essentially what are called blue roofs. So the water detention itself is going to occur on the roof surfaces um, in, in discussion with our structural engineer and with the civil engineer. Um, we have all this roof area, as you mentioned. So we will be detaining it here. And then as it slowly filters through the system, it will then run out to the storm sewer um, that's at diversion. So uh, it'll be, retained or detained on the, on the roof and then um, let into the system, you know, per engineering requirements um, out onto diversion. So um, there's nothing going anywhere but north onto diversion off of the, the roof system. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. So essentially a green roof system, which- It is basically a green roof system. Yeah, they, they call them blue roofs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, you know, just to echo some of the comments earlier uh, regarding the public benefit, I think that, you know, to me, I look at I look at the land use and the zoning of the site and, and the options to develop the site. You know, um, if this were just a straight rezoning to a multifamily piece, that's kind of multifamily dis district. That that's really where I'm looking at this, saying, okay, what what could somebody do if they were to want to build this? by way of straight zoning and rezoning. And basically what you're asking for is over and above what that would give you, um, which is fine. And that's great that we have this. And I think the use is appropriate. And I think that the building is, is, is very attractive. But from a, from a recognizable benefit to the community, I'm looking at, um, I'm kind of weighing it against that to see what, what sort of you know, additional units, additional heights, additional deviations that you're getting in regard to straight zoning. And then from that, I think that's where we look for, you know, some level of what, what's the benefit to the community in, in doing that trade-off. So I am interested to see what you can propose. I do think things like pedestrian connectivity to the downtown is very important. I think that that's, that's something I'd be interested to see how you can explore that and what, what you could potentially come up with uh, in that regard. So I, I just offer that. And, and again, to echo what was said earlier, Trash collection, I think, is a problem that needs to be figured out a little bit. Um, the garage door uh, access there, I could see the issue, and it's probably something that needs um, 
to be addressed. I, I'm a little bit less concerned, but still something that that does need to be addressed. So um, I think that uh, I think that covers it for me at this point. And then I suppose I guess the last thing would just be the building materials as we move into the public hearing and move into the next stage. Um, be interested to see what a little more detail on what you're proposing there. Sure. Um, I, I would just like to mention on the trash issue, and I, and I agree it maybe isn't ideal, but we did speak specifically with GFL, um, and, and this was actually their proposed solution, and maybe we need to go to a Republic or someone else, but their comment to us is we do this all the time in Royal Oak and other uh, areas where we have buildings with these situations. So. Um, we would propose, again, I know there was the comment that it might be unsightly. Uh, we are proposing a compactor. We are proposing that it be limited to uh, pickup being one day a week. So uh, the alternative, you know, I'll, we're, we'll certainly look into that. But I, I, I did want to mention that this was the result of conversations with, with GFL on, on how to handle this. Mr. Chairman, I just thought you know, Mr. Bavakwa, I lost his internet connection. That's why you saw him pop off there. Repeat that, Nick. I didn't catch that. Yeah, sorry, uh, Mr. Bavakwa just texted me and his internet connection went down. So that's okay. why he might not be here. Okay. Dean, are you with us? I think he is. Okay. Got it. Any other uh, comments for Roger? <clears throat> Roger, I'll just kind of summarize. I, um, I, I think the building is striking. I, very, it's very attractive, and it would be a great use on a on a piece that probably is not going to get used, uh, not likely going to get used again. Um, but I think there are some significant hurdles here that have to be met before you can come back, and we can even entertain the thought of a of a public hearing, and you can do them as promptly or take your time with them, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, the, uh, the special project status, you know, we've dealt with it in the past and we've had some success, some not. I, I for one, think just this providing us with a check does not meet that goal or does, does not meet that hurdle. I think, I think the burden is yours to examine with the city administration precisely what kind of a public benefit you can propose to contribute and uh, and be prepared to meet the commitment that you make if you were to ever get site plan approval with that inside. Just accepting money does not put the burden on you, the requester of this project. I, I think you, you can't put it on us or on Nick and, and the manager to say, you know what's best we want you this is a this is a very large project we want your imagination we want your work to uh investigate with the city precisely what you can do that adds real community benefit not just dollars so that that's an important thing uh, a little more specifically for me um i have trouble with the lack of circulation most of you know I'm an old public safety guy, and you probably uh, have heard my comments and questions to that effect over the years. I think the uh, the driveway on the west side solves a lot of problems, and I know that puts a burden on you and puts a burden on the potential new owner of that property. But to get the loading off of diversion along the side, created create a loading zone area, which is another big concern we have here. Um, I think that's something that should be pursued significantly. Over a hundred year life of this building, it will be a lot more comfortable for the people who live here and the people who drive that road if we can pull that traffic off the road somehow or another. I think that's critically important. In terms of parking, please don't propose something contrived. Uh, Mr. Stone mentioned the one site, the one parking spot. Um, I mean, you have to picture, I don't know who's going to move into this building, but that, that spot will result in a lot of dented fenders and scraped walls because it's just too tight. So 
don't try to fit 20 pounds in the 10 pound bag here. I mean, make sure it is good, usable parking. Don't don't look for a variance from us on a special project. We're we're probably not going to grant it to you. I can just I can just say that now. This building must be able to park itself. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's an intense development, and I don't think anybody here is is open to uh, in, uh, giving any kind of variance in terms of uh, with with special project consideration or seeing you go to try to seek a variance from the uh, zoning board of appeals. I mean, do it right the first time, get it done right, think it through, and uh, you know, parking is really critical. Um, I think that's all I had. Parking, loading, traffic. Uh, if you're not gonna put the spaces out in front, for example, maybe look at a turn lane if we have to live with the uh, diversion entrance. There's space out there to propose a, a, uh, a turn lane it provides a little bit of stacking to be able to make that turn. So these these are just things that you know think them through. Um, I don't. I'm. I want to encourage you. I mean, I I really find it striking. I did the the first time, but it's a tough one. So I encourage you to dig deep and uh, keep in touch with the administration and get this right and come back and see us again. Yeah. Miss thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just to say, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to bring up one point that's been raised on a couple of the most recent projects, Riverfront, and also the one, um, I forget the address, but the one on Main Street, the Brownstone development. Yes. Um, it was brought up late in the process there. I think the applicant, you know, if he's not familiar with how the planning sessions have, planning commission sessions have gone for those, should be aware that, um, you know, the issue of uh, development bond. Um, or a bond to, you know, potentially restore the property to the original condition should development, you know, be halted was asked from both of those properties. I think it's something, you know, don't want to spring at the last minute, but if that's something that the commission would want to see for a project like this, I certainly think that applicant should be aware of it sooner than later. I think that's good that you brought that up, Sarah, and I, I forgot, but uh, in the last project, Mr. Schneider's project on North Main, we made it clear, not just to him, but to the community, that this is an evolving thing for us, understanding construction bonds and uh, development agreements that have financial considerations. And it might be worth your while to review the uh, the minutes of that last meeting so you see exactly where we're coming from. But I, I believe that will be expected of you in this case. Mr. Chairman, this is Christian Hauser, if I may. I um... I agree. And I should have said something about that when I was speaking is that uh, I think it's critical that the applicant come back and be prepared to discuss a plan or proposal or some type of, of uh, remedy that the applicant would have in the event that the project doesn't get completed or stalls or is suspended because personally, and I think other people, the commission are going to want to have that assurance that this isn't going to sit there half built or in various stages of completion over over several years. So thank you for the other commissioners for bringing that up. I think it's a it's a critical issue that needs to be addressed when you come back. Thank you, Sarah, for catching that. That's a good one. Anyone do we else? on that topic, do we have any updates as far as any other projects on the on the bond issue? Nick, uh, could you help us there? On the bond issue? That, oh yeah. um Mr. Randazzo, you mean? Mr. Randazzo, Mr. Schneider. Yeah, so Mr. Schneider's in, I think he's on his, he is on his last review with engineering. We should have that approved any moment now. He'll get started. Um, Mr. Randazzo, he, I see that he called me today, but he didn't leave a message. I talked to him two weeks ago. He was working on the development agreement to get to uh, uh, Attorney Crott. And it's up to him when he brings it in that we would we promised the mayor and council that we would give them ample time, month, whatever, to review everything before we brought them forward. It's winter. I don't think I know he he doesn't need to rush at this point. I'm guessing. So, um, but when I find out, I can let the commissioners know if he's changed his time frame. But last I heard, he was still working on the development agreement. Thank you. Anything else for this uh, petitioner? 
I just have one more comment. Go ahead. Mayor. Yeah, so um, I appreciate this conversation. I mean, I think, you know, the building looks pleasing, I think Commissioner Hauser said. I, I probably agree with that. Um, and I understand this is a difficult property. Um, and, but I am concerned because it, I mean, you know, you have to have a huge property for the investment you put in, but I mean, that's, that's not really our problem. I mean, that's not really the planning commission's issue. So, I mean, there's just, to me, this is, um, a big ask because we're giving a lot of consideration above and beyond. And, you know, I, I've got questions about that. So just those are, you know, some of my concerns. Um, you know, it's these special projects, um, you know, we're, give, we're given a lot. We're going around a lot of different things that we we do and i mean we have that in the ordinance but um you know i'm concerned about this and i mean there's a whole list of things that we talked about that were asked to give away and you know i i have to really consider if that's appropriate or not for this project thank you thank you sir roger good luck uh mr chair dean yes yeah i, do, I just had a comment about community benefit in general um, you know, Vidya talked about how important the community benefit element is to this uh, special project consideration. And uh, I guess I'd just like people to think about the fact that uh, when you're talking about something benefiting the community, um, it's it's supposed to be kind of directly tied to the neighborhood around that, that, that project. And, um, you know, just keep in mind that if you have people showing up from the community around that project with pitchforks, and torches, um, it, I, it makes it's pretty hard to justify that there's some sort of community benefit that's been brought to the table by this project that the community should be happy about. So just keep that in mind as we uh, consider these. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Roger. We'll see you soon. Well, thank you. I just want to say that I appreciate everyone's time and thoughtfulness in this project. If there's one thing we love, it's a design challenge. So I'm going to meet the challenge and exceed your expectations. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out, um, this is a benefit to the community. 41 units in this development, in this, this site's going to be developed one way or another um, in the future. So my personal belief is we're doing it the right way and it's the right project at the right time. Um, it's just progress. Um, I've got a site plan from 1992 that shows a 10,000 square foot, tiny little Frank Lloyd Wright office that if it was built would have been a disaster on that site. So, you know, we have to balance all these things. And from the bottom of my heart, we're we're doing the best we can with this site. I'm not trying to be cynical about it. I'm not trying to flip it for a dollar. Uh, we believe in this project, and I hope that you know the next time we come in front of you, you guys will see that you know we've put the effort in to make the changes to the site based on your comp. So, again, I thank you for your time and look forward to getting in front of you again. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank Okay, uh, item number six, public hearing for the existing infill development ordinance. Vidya. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Julie is also on board here tonight with me. Uh, the infill mind? ordinance has been before you multiple times for discussion. And at the last meeting, you scheduled a public hearing subject to some changes being made to the ordinance, least of uh, not which was addition of illustrations for everything. You wanted the infill ordinance to be easy to understand for anyone who was picking it up. So we have made all the changes to the ordinance. We believe the effort that has gone in in discussing this at various stages and coming up with regulations that clearly reflect the way it has been interpreted. That should be the correct interpretation. 
and that will address some of the concerns that the planning commission and the citizens have had this ordinance is a good one i will now defer it to julie so she can summarize what changes have been made the last time i just go over in brief the ordinance for the members of the public who are here uh, before public hearing is open so julie if you would just go ahead please do you want to share i'll stop sharing no, that's okay, Vidya. If you, you want to leave this up, that's perfect. Um, you know, as Vidya said, this has been a month long process of really taking an in, in depth look at the infill ordinance. And what we heard from you, the Planning Commission, was that, you know, for the most part, the ordinance is working pretty well. There might be a few things that we think fall outside of of the scope of these uh, amendments that we could address down the road, but primarily the amendments that we are proposing here tonight um, are their housekeeping items. They're going to make sure that it's clear that we are administering the infill uh, housing standards consistently and that things like egress window wells and sunken patios, things that we know exist and in the case of the former are required are clearly permitted by the ordinance. So uh, we have made all of the changes that you requested the last time we brought it before you, um, primarily including those illustrations. So um, an average grade illustration, uh, an eave overhang illustration, you're building uh, infill lot projections. So what elements can and cannot project into which yards um, and how we would measure that. Uh, the eave overhang, the attached and detached garage setbacks, which are consistent with what are currently in the section 2102 accessory structure section. So just bringing that into consistency there. And then there's one last illustration to show um, what we're talking about with the egress window well and particularly the, the cover. So the changes that we have made in terms of text amendment, uh, the text itself since the last uh, iteration of this draft, um, mostly just cleaning it up for you. So um, removing typos, uh, qualifying some language um, in B5, you know, supported by a building foundation, we changed that to that are an extension of the building footprint that was addressing the comment um, that some building features may be post supported, even though they are uh, otherwise similar to this. We remove stairwells and chimneys from the list of cantilevered building features, um, which is considered that confusing and it probably falls under that, uh, the, the supported by a building foundation category. Uh, and then we change the rear lot line setback standard from five feet to three feet for detached garages to align with section 2102. So those are, oh, and the last one, I'm sorry. We, we changed, uh, we added the word hinged after permanently anchored in the egress window well section to really put a fine point. And you know, the illustration I think helps what we're talking about there. We, we don't want the covers completely unsecured, but we, don't want people to assume that means they have to be bolted down because that defeats the purpose. So that is really the extent of the changes and we're happy to answer any questions. Commissioners? I, I had a couple. Um, talking about the hinge top, and, and this may already be included in the building code, but um, a hinge top should be able to support the weight of a firefighter or a police officer going around. Should we state that in here that the that the top must be able to uh, support a, a person walking through there, or is that covered elsewhere? I would not add that because it would depend whether the firefighter is 120 pounds or 250. So. Uh... I think it, as long as we say it's a hinged cover, and I believe the covers that are available um, do have to meet building code standards, and the building official will be approving them so that they meet the minimum standards. I don't want to add so much detail into it that you box yourself into a corner if a new product comes out in. Nick, are you comfortable with that? Is it covered elsewhere? 
Yeah, I, yes, sir. I talked to Randy and the building code would address it appropriately, weight bearing, non weight bearing, egress, ingress. So I'm okay with the way it's written now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> the other one, uh, go ahead, Dean. Like uh, ju just to follow up on that a little bit, if people have an egress window, they may um, have a, a desire for light to be going into that quite often. Um, what's to stop them from just keeping it open all the time and it not serving its purpose? For the most part, the hinged lid, the way it works is it does remain closed. If you're going to prop it up, you're basically inviting it as a, it's going to become a little dumpster hole because it's going to be an enclosed place where all the leaf, all the debris is going to collect. It's going to defeat the whole purpose of why you even have a window well. Rather than light, it's going to be a place for debris to collect. So I think Many of the new window lids that you get, they allow for light filtration really well. I speak from personal experience because I have one in my house. The light just filters in. It's bright as daylight down there too. So I believe the covers, depends on the cover style you pick. If you want daylight, it's still going to help you. Uh, someone else started to speak. Was it you, Sarah? Yeah, I was just, I was a little concerned, and I brought this up kind of at the last meeting with these hinged. We, ours recently, we did a um, metal, it's basically a very heavy duty metal grate that covers, it does have openings. So you do get leaves and stuff that you need to take out, but you get all the light and all that. And it obviously would hold weight very well. I get concerned with a hinge feature. What if these aren't properly maintain, maintained? Can they get stuck and you've now trapped somebody? in the basement because they can't open the hinge or something gets pushed up against that corner there and it's blocking it and you can't properly open it. I know that's, you know, up to homeowner to maintain, but I just don't want to do something from a safety standpoint that would put somebody at risk. So the hinged lid basically is a flip top. It is not a latch. So when the lid closes, it's not going to lock itself. At any point of time, it's like a, a pop-up. So any pressure you put in it will open. And these lids are made of a durable enough material, but if you want to smash through it, you can. It is, it is fully, fully doable. There is no latch at the portion of the lid that comes down that will lock it in position. So, so if somebody's coming out from the inside or from the outside, you should be able to just lift it like a, you know, those chips, lids. You know, you just flip it off and on it goes. It, it'll work mm -hmm. something like that. Jim and McGee, you had a question for us? Yeah, um, yeah, I may not have fully understood this, but our side-facing front garages permitted? No, yeah. this ordinance deals only with infill provisions. This is not amending the garage ordinance that you had already adopted. That is a whole separate discussion that will be driven by your master plan process where you will discuss uh, impervious surface area and community character. That the change to that ordinance should come as a result of your master plan discussion because that will have a significant impact on how the community looks. So, so as it currently stands, side-facing front garages are not permitted? No. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have a couple or two items, if I may. Yeah. On um, item on eaves, it's item number six for the graphic. And I'm, I'm guessing the graphic where it says side yard to the dash line to the center line really means to go all the way to the face of the house, not to the and does. Point, point of the gutter. That's one thing, and on that same thing, I'm the question whether we should include a gutter in the projection using 18 inches as the number. Gutters are five or six inches typically, and that's sizing. You get a five inch or a six inch gutter. So if you, if you take that off of 18 inches, you'd end up with 12 as an E. I'm not really um, sure if that is appropriate just in conventional construction, 12 inches, say, versus 16. So 
I would almost say let's make it 16 inches and not include the gutter. And that makes it more conventional, at least in my thinking. And then the gutter could be five or six inches on top of the 16. I believe last time this did come up, Commissioner Gasson, and we discussed it. The concern was um, if somebody were to, first of all, pick these narrow lots, you have a 16 inch wide eave, on top of that, a six inch gutter. Now you are talking about it being 22 inches. So you're just under two feet. You're already sticking out. Your side yard is only five feet. That leaves three feet. If your neighbor does the same thing, you're literally creating a kind of tunnel. If, if you look up, you're going to create like a narrow strip of buildings. I think that's why we wanted to stick with the 18 inches, which is the convention we have seen in lots of communities and lakeside communities that tend to have narrower lots like we have in Rochester, 50 foot wide lots. We have seen 18 inches be the standard. The larger eaves for lots that are bigger, that have room to do it, but this is for infill development narrower lots. So that, that was the reason for recommending AP. Okay. So but do you have anything to add? What is it currently? Jenny, what is it? Uh, it's currently it's currently 18 inches. So you'll see we just that strike out not more than 18 inches. So that was the language. We just changed it to up to 18 inches to make it a little bit more approachable in terms of language, but it didn't used to include the gutters. That was a suggestion that we made after, you know, kind of many discussions about side yard projections in particular in these really narrow lots um, encroaching closer and closer to your neighbor's property. Nick, are you still with us? Yes, sir. You know, you're on the street. You're the one that talks with these people who want to build these houses, the, the developers, et cetera. Are what, we, what we're proposing to do here tonight, is this all practical? Is it going to cause problems for you? It, not problems, a couple of challenges, but I've already dealt with them a couple of times, and they're reasonable. Um, I think we will want to address the side yard, side facing front loaded garages or courtyard garages down the line, but I think we can live with this. Okay. So this is better than what we have now. More this clear. More yes. clear. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is scheduled for a public hearing tonight. And so uh, I'm going to open the public hearing at 843. And uh, first, I'm going to ask Sianna if uh, you've received any communication on this and uh, if you have anyone waiting to speak with us tonight. I have not received any communication, and everyone who was on here actually left off, so no. <laughs> okay. So there are others there, but they've moved on. and But no one that, who said that they wanted to speak on this tonight? No. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So uh, no one else waiting relative to the public hearing. It's uh, on TV. It's been widely published. And with that, I'm going to close the public hearing. We'll call it 844. And uh, we're back to the commissioners for discussion. And then consideration, did you have a motion to approve and send it on to council? Is that what we're looking for tonight? Yes, please. That, that would be the motion recommended for approval to city council. So moved. So that's been moved by Mr. Lord. Is there support? With, uh, and I suppose we should uh, clarify um, Mr. Gasson's comments regarding uh, the setbacks on the illustration on number six. Yes, we will correct that before it goes to yeah. council. Okay. Do we have support? Uh, I have a question for the group. Yes. Um, after a house or home has been built and uh, followed this, who goes around and checks that they maintain their their property as it was built? Uh, who enforces, in essence, our rules here? I can answer that, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Nick. Um, so the building official would be in charge of enforcing the city codes. So. Um, before a final CFO is issued, 
Their job is to ensure and, and seek help if they need engineering help, et cetera, any interpretations. But, but his job solely, lit, written right in the uh, uh, ordinances, his job is to enforce the existing rules and conditions from city actions. So it would be the billion. Right. So after I get my CFO and you know everyone moves on to the next, what's to stop me from removing my cap or cover over my gotcha my, my window and, and who enforces it then? Yeah, I would say that that would be to be honest, it would be complaint driven and then code enforcement would at that point. Not on it happens a lot. <laughs> Not Your neighbor would something. complain about you, Matt. Yeah. I think the one thing people could maybe easily get away with, because I correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe you need a permit to add gutters. So somebody could not have added gutters and add them later on and get past the 18 inches. When I read, when I saw that, that would probably be the, <coughs> the biggest one. Excuse me. I would agree with that, Sarah, that that would be easy to do. I'll just put my gutters on later and see who catches me. But we'll make the building official aware of it, you know, in final CFO, but to Matt's point, if in fact it's after the fact you get your CFO, you're right. Unless somebody complained, we're probably not going to notice that. But but if they did complain, we would follow up, I'll tell you that. Okay. Matt, did that answer your question? Yeah, I was just wondering. I wasn't uh, complaining or anything. So Complaint driven. I think that's a good answer. That explained it for me. Any other comments? Okay, been um, moved. And Matt, did you support this? Sure, yes. Okay. Uh, the roll call, please. Lord. Yes. Stone? Yes. Gasson? Yes. Hauser? Yes. King? <clears throat> King? Yes. Bavacqua? Yes. Dixon? Yes. Clark Martin? Clerk Martin. <laughs> McGee. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, quit fiddling with the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Julie and uh, Vidya, thanks for taking us through that. That's uh, dry as uh, cotton, and uh, we made it through, and I think we made some good improvements there. So thanks for your assistance. You're welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, number seven, miscellaneous from the commissioners. Any any miscellaneous comments? Hearing none. Uh, Seattle, one more time. Anyone from the public uh, waiting to speak with us? No, there is not. Okay, thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Chairman, I have a comment, if I may. Please. Um, the The traffic study information we got tonight basically says it's okay and at least in summary form and i've heard that almost every single time we've had a traffic report in many years and i'm wondering and they must be really good i mean experts provide that information but i'm i'm losing faith in the information we get because as one of the commissioners pointed out maybe it was a resident it says it's contrary to the practical or the real experience that we see when we're driving up and down these streets but the reports say it's okay and i'm not sure if there's a, a real remedy to what the point is that's in my head but somehow it just seems odd that we keep getting reports saying everything's fine I don't Mr. expect an answer, just point, bringing no. it out. Uh, if, Mr. Chair, if I, I would like to address that for Mr. Gass, because I think it's a great question, if you don't Please. mind. Um, so I, I think what would help, you, you know, in our sustainability chart, we have numbers, right? I think zero to 10, you need a lot of work, 10 to 14, whatever the numbers are. It's all relative because on traffic, it, we have to set a threshold of at what point do we say you can't say it doesn't matter anymore? Is that during rush hour? Is that at three o'clock in the afternoon? Is that at 10 o'clock in the morning? Because I would guess the facts don't lie. When they calculate their their impact, it's 
say it's 80 cars going out. What is our threshold? Is 80 cars too many? Knowing they have five different ways to go when they get out. And I think we it would help the developers or help even the consultants to say, just like the sustainability number, if you're going to push the needle a little worse, how much worse can you push before you can't say anymore? It doesn't matter. Because that one car matters, right? Because 10 cars matter more than one. Where is being reasonable that you can add 10 more cars on the first street at 10 in the afternoon, 10 in the morning, doesn't, it's negligible. And I think it'd be helpful if we actually created a scale for ourselves on traffic, um, the, our level of discomfort with traffic addition. So A, B, C, D, E, F is a standard in the industry. None of those, it's hard to change from a D to an E or an E to an F, you, big numbers. 40 cars, 80 cars will not push that by the way that it's written. So we'd have to set our own standards of our comfort with how much more is enough. So and I think that maybe in part of the master plan, that's what we talk about. Maybe this commission talks about. It. Maybe we bring in a traffic consultant again to, to deal with reality. But the perception that first street's horrible, I drive it every day five times. 99% of the time, it's there's nobody there. But at certain times, yeah, 10 more cars is going to make you have a left on the Castell wait while somebody's coming out making a left. So I, I get it. It's just our threshold of what we think is sustainable and healthy for our road system. Um, so I, I just throw that out there. It's only going to get worse, as we know. Is there some... Uh, the traffic studies that we get obviously serve the developer who applies for them. Is there some way for the city to be the uh, the intended recipient of the uh, traffic study? Still at the developer's expense, but kind of where we're the master. We're you know we want to hear from you relative to our standards, not the developer's standards. Is there some way to do that, Nick? So so we did that. So Mayor and Dean, you can help me. Uh, on this one that uh, Mayor Potem, that we we went out for proposals. We had two people submit. Sienna, was it 90000 and a hundred and some thousand dollars? And they came back and said, we'd be glad to take your money, but we're going to give you traffic facts. It doesn't matter if you're the client or they're the client. Our reputation is we have to give you facts. Now, how you interpret them, again, what your level of comfortability is with the, the facts it's on you, but you don't need to spend that much money. We took it to council. They agreed that well, as long as they submit facts from registered traffic engineers. And it's IT standard, so it doesn't really matter. It, it, exactly. the yeah. yeah, and Mr. Mr. Chairman, I just I think the city council had some of the same comments and questions that Commissioner Gasson had. And it's like, yeah. Why? Why are we paying a hundred thousand dollars or whatever it was going to be to have a study that says nothing's changing when right. there's a feeling that things are changing? So I mean, it was, yeah, um, you know, it's always good to have more information, I guess. But at the yeah. time, the cost it just didn't seem like the value of another traffic study was worth it at the time. So Ben. Okay. It simply yeah, falls Mr. back on us. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, what Mrs. Turner said today, you, you heard her say, it, if there's a backup somewhere, I cut down another street. You can't, that's not normal activity that you can, you don't know how many people are going to do that a day because there's a dead animal on the road and they can't get around it. But traffic generated by development, we can set a threshold for ourselves for to become yeah, a dialogue you might want to have. Yeah. Well, I, I and again, I think too, sometimes, in my opinion, we, you know, some of the metrics that they use says like at the riverfront, Riverwalk, you know, they said, well, everybody goes to Rochester Road. Well, I think a lot of us feel like, well, we know a lot of people are going up First Street to get to Livernoy. Yeah. So, you know, some, yeah. You, you know, sometimes, you, you know, you feel like you're anti-science, but at the same time, I think people see what they see. 
Nick, what if we required them to count? I, I'm thinking a riverfront or river place. What if we required them to count over a longer period of time? That's yeah, it was based on a like a two day, uh, two two consecutive day study. Yeah, I, I agree. And what we did on that one, unfortunately, COVID, we would be cheating. We would make it easier on them than normal, right? Because yeah. half the traffic's on the roads now. So they could easily come back and say, oh, look, nobody's there. Well, that's because nobody's going to work. They're working from home. So we didn't want to give them too much leeway. But what we did do, I can tell you this. When they first came in, I sat down and video and I talked about this. And they were yelling at me about, why are you making me count Castell, Harding, and Livernoy? I'm like, because that's where the people, like the mayor just said, if you're local, you know how to get over to Livernoy right. that way. And then we that that spot that resulted in me calling the planner and the traffic engineer in, in Rochester Hills saying, why do you have a no turn on red there when there is no scientific proof that you can you should eliminate that sign because you can see far enough down the road, it doesn't meet standards. You know what the answer was? Well, in 1968, we put it there, and I guess we're just going to leave it. Well, that's horrible. <laughs> so they screw their own people up and our people by blocking that thing up for a half a mile in the morning. So they're kind of adamant about that. And so we told the developers, we, it's a, I know it's a half a mile away, but it matters. That intersection's – you're telling me some people are going that way. We want it counted. So we will err on the side of gathering more information – Counting cars weren't appropriate. So we can't say, you know, but nothing ever seems to change. They better be able to prove it or else Vidya and her team will not accept that data. I, I know that. The challenge over here is when we ask for a traffic study, we are asking it of professional traffic engineers. Uh, the engineer from Police and Vanderbrink, which is the company that did Riverfront Police and which did tonight's 210 diversion study too. I mean, their traffic engineers are using the data. We can give them the parameters, like take a look at the traffic that is going on First Street towards Livernoy or take a look at traffic on Harding, Castell. They come back with that data and they say, still going to make no difference. Now, here's the challenge. At that point, when they come up with data and they're putting the numbers in front of me, and that's why I made a remark today, the report still says that it's going to have no impact, but the reality we hear from the people live and drive down the street is that there is an impact. So the only way to resolve it is if the city has, and no standalone traffic study is going to solve this problem. You will have to have your own traffic study and then you will have to have a system to maintain it and regularly when a developer turns in their traffic study, you will have to evaluate it against your study to see where it fits in or whether it doesn't. Without having your own base data to compare it to, you have no basis for refuting a professional engineer's yeah. study that they have submitted to you. And that, that's where we are in a sort of catch-22 situation. I mean, I pulled over the traffic study for tonight's project in detail. I saw all their numbers. If I strictly look at the numbers, and I'm a student of science, I was like, okay, what they're saying makes sense. But I know the reality from what we have heard is that's, that's not how it works. So... Um, there's no simple solution to the problem. But if there's any good news, we do have experience with one development. So First Street Lofts came in, and we a lot of people, the same people that are complaining now that still live there had concerns, and none of that came true. So the facts are, after we did do traffic counts and things, and somehow that, pro, that the, they go left, right, up and down. I don't know how, but that has a lot of potential impact, and it had zero. So, and that's yeah. what their study said was going to have all. It helps it all. That study, reality, um, portrayed exactly what they said in that study, that you will not notice the impact of all those people coming out of work in the morning. I, I'm with that, with uh, whoever said they've never seen that, I think the developer, he's never seen the gate open. Either have I, and I go down there all the time. So it's, that's, that's a good example. That was built. How many units was that? that? Nick, how many units was that? That's before my time. How yeah, I that? think that's seven, 76 units, I think. Mm. And you so don't notice it's there. Uh, yeah, it's it's weird. but I never see him going in off the alley either. I mean, I walk down through there all the very, time. Very, very, yeah. very rarely. It's 
I wonder what the occupancy rate is. I've seen oh, 100%. four lease signs since it's been built. It's been 100% with the waiting list until COVID. Now wow. I think they're back at 90%. Wow, that's impressive. It is. I know they did okay. I, they dropped their rent structure, but they wanted to keep it full. I think the, the challenge you have with traffic studies, I think in general, is that you you know you're com you're comparing your impact, basically the existing conditions, and if your impact of twenty cars, thirty cars doesn't trip it from an A to a B or a B to a C or whatever, then it's basically a a no impact. Um, so what ends up happening is it's almost like the last guy in that gets penalized that pushes yeah, it to the edge. Getting these things on. Right, but you're not you're not sort of dealing with the cumulative effect, you know. So I know some areas will have you know impact assessments. They'll assess each property on their impact to traffic along the way. I'm not necessarily suggesting that, but I know that some do that. Um, some county road commissions do that. Uh, you know, we're a city that's maintaining our roads, so we don't necessarily have those policies in place. But it's you know it's it's definitely something to think about. Yeah, and one of the, if I may, Mr. Chairman, and one of the things like in most big cities, you are 100% right. Somehow you get a voluntary fund set up that they have to widen the road, add a new signal. And we talked about this before. In Rochester, I can't widen an inch of any road. No, no, all I can no, do is no. change timing on lights, and MDOT gives us three extra seconds. So it's a right, little think, frustrating that we can't make it better. And think about this like we're talking about a public benefit of $35,000 or whatever today. Well, the new traffic signal is like two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Exactly. If, if I'm the last guy in and my development trips me into needing a traffic signal, I mean, you know, I might be putting twenty extra cars or thirty extra cars in the road, and all of a sudden I'm on the hook for yep. something like that. So it's one it's one thing to look at traffic studies, but if we say that we need some off-site road improvements because of my development, those that's where you start getting into some serious expenses. It's true. So when uh, we're working right now with the chief financial and they on their own said we would come in and put a, a dedicated right extra right turn lane on diversion at Main. So we'd have two out, two rights out, one left out because they know they are going to have impact on that intersection. And it's really going to impact their own people trying to get out of the it credit is. union. It so is. they're willing to pay big money on their own. Ways to do that. I think the only project that actually made a significant road improvement was the Overlook. They added a significant stretch yeah. of center turn lane up on Letica. Yeah. That was the only traffic study, and that was only 75 units. But they were the only ones who did a study that said, yes, you need signalization, you need an additional lane added. They did all of that. I just looked up first street lots. Uh, it was 50 units. 50 units. Okay, thank you. And full. And no setbacks. I mean, if it was going to be complicated, it would be really complicated. I mean, First that lost us before a sustainable True. Okay, any other miscellaneous discussion? Uh, Seattle, number nine, upcoming events. Yeah, so the only item we have for the next meeting, which is November 19th, is consideration of a site plan to renovate the existing U.S. scuba building for Chief Financial Credit Union to add a drive-up ATM and relocate the current branch activities in their administration building located at 515 South Rochester Road. So it'll be a short meeting. Nick, is there any value in, uh, I mean, we haven't met the new consultant we're going to be working with on the uh, master plan. Is there any value in bringing them in for a... George, how do you do? I think that might not be a bad idea. Blaine and I talked about it. Um, I, I will run it by Blaine, and uh, that's very possible because that should be a short meeting. And they could introduce themselves. I think that's a pretty good idea. And I think that's all we're looking for. We're not looking for a big presentation, but okay. No, the sooner we uh, get comfortable with these people, the quicker we're ready to move on. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Any other uh, items? Or the uh, yeah, can I make one comment? I'm uh, I'm just a tad bit offended by Mr. Stone's uh, shirt tonight. Um, <laughs> Let's see what stood up. I can't. Yeah, uh, green. Oh, green. Oh, oh great. Sorry, Mayor. Man. Go green. That was, that was the most embarrassing event of the weekend. It was not a good, not not a good event. I didn't need that reminder, but <laughs> we have long memories sometimes. 
with that team, you better have a real long memory because it's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, if you haven't voted for members of the commission and also members of the public, get out and do it tomorrow. No matter what your position, get out and vote. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.